Next up on Spokes, we take a look at Louisiana's handicapped community. Not all handicapped people are helpless, and they've started a semi-radical movement to speak up for their rights. That's next on Folks. Hello and welcome to Folks. Our entire program tonight is devoted to those people who are physically disabled. Many of us who are not handicapped have a tendency to forget about those who are. Too many times we non-handicappers make up the rules that shape the lives of men, women, and children who appear to be helpless just because they don't have complete control or use of their body. Well, there's one thing that I found out while researching this topic, and I'll share my discovery with you. Not all handicapped people are helpless, and they started a semi-radical movement to speak up for their rights. One such man is Dan Gerard, a man who didn't give up his love to create art just because he was blind. I have a, a degree in advertising and graphic design from the Memphis Academy of Arts in 1971, mm -hmm. and from there I moved to Florida trying to get my master's in, in painting and that's when I lost my eyesight. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a professional artist and while undergoing therapy with my eyes, the doctor said if I were to continue in art that I had better start thinking three-dimensionally. Well, I, I'm, I'm basically a, an organic sculptor which means that I take most of my shapes from nature my forms are from nature or from my past experience from my uh, visual world. Uh, I almost appreciate this life better in that I don't assume things anymore. I have to touch everything and that vision is somewhat a, a distortion of reality. We think we see things the way they are but they really may not exist in reality like that. How we perceive art is normally a visual experience, but for sculptor Dan Gerard and thousands of other visually handicapped people, art is hard to appreciate because they can't see it. Art galleries and museums add to the problem because they keep people away from displays, not allowing them to touch and experience the exhibit. In October of 1980, sculptor Joe Brandom and the State School for the Visually Impaired held Louisiana's first three-dimensional art exhibit designed especially for the visually handicapped. Several years ago, I was at a museum and was reprimanded for touching something that was on display there. And I've always felt that art should be experienced as fully as you can with all of your senses. And the handicapped do not have this opportunity to experience it at all, the visually handicapped. So. I got the idea of having a, a show, a gallery show, where everyone, including the, handi the handicapped, could come in and not only look at the thing, the, the objects that were there, but play with them and, and listen to them and, and touch them and pick them up. This year, 35 artists from around the country submitted pieces, but Dan Gerard continues to be one of only two artists who are visually handicapped. It was told to me that when people look at my artwork, it pleases both senses, the sight and the touch. So indirectly, I'm, I must be doing something right. So when you look at my artwork, 
it, it stimulates y your vision and it makes you want to go and touch it. So why uh, deprive society of that? And of course, one of our goals in, in, when we wrote the original grant is to create more access for the blind in um, an area of appreciation of art and to make the public more aware of the special needs of impaired individuals like blind people. I think that one, uh, the other advantage uh, that a type of show like this has is also for sighted people in the fact that people who have absolutely no contact with art and art objects can come to the show and to can pick up and to look at and to feel objects that have been made and get an idea of what it's like to hold the material and have some sort of communication with the material and get a little bit of a better understanding to, as to what an artist does when they sit down and they work and what's involved in the whole process. And I think that that's one advantage that, a, that an exhibition like this has uh, for everyone in the community. Before the public got a chance to see and feel the exhibit, Robert Lyon was invited to judge the pieces. The only judging stipulation was for the judge to be visually impaired. Uh, not at all. I really can't detect light. Hmm. I'm unable to uh, really decide on this. It's, it's obviously uh, etched or engraved in some way. I can't see yeah. it at all. <laughs> Blow into it. Oh, I understand. <laughs> Surely. Oh, yes. God. <laughs> True. Beautiful. Sorry. <laughs> well, this is uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I get a what, what's really nice about this thing is it's, it's like a cat or something, and uh, rubbing your hand over the back or wherever this uh, this texture is, and going over those little sensors and creating that noise. Uh, is really nice. This is one of the nicest things we've seen today, I think, so far. Well, I think that uh, one of the most interesting aspects about uh, during the show uh, a couple weeks ago was, was the, uh, the fact that I really experienced a real difference uh, in, some, in some of the cases between the pieces uh, when I looked at them blindfolded as opposed to when I looked at them visually that in some cases I was just completely fooled by the tactile qualities of the pieces and when I came back and actually looked at it I had no idea what I was looking at and I think that doing this workshop today and tomorrow is really going to help clarify I think in my mind about some of these tactile experiences as well as for these kids. I'll tell you what we're going to do I want each of you to come over into this, and we're going to start making a circle, walking around in it. Can you feel it? How's that feel? Now, I'm going to start adding water. And as I add water, it's going to start getting stiffer and stiffer, so you need to walk harder and harder, right? This is one of the, this is one of the oldest ways to mix clay. See how stiff it's starting to get? That's the kind of, that's what, that's what we need, right? Otherwise, if it's too soft, we can't work with it. I think that when you go to an exhibition and when they go to, like the one we have for the visually impaired, 
that they can feel and look at all these things with their hands. However, they don't always know how they come about. And that working in clay themselves, and just even mixing clay today, uh, some may feel think that clay comes from a bag or from a store or God knows where it comes from, but it gives them a real concrete idea of how it's made and how it's prepared, and now they'll be able to pick it up in their hands and start molding it and start making things. And I think that that's where they'll really be able to complete the connection from artist as a maker to the finished object and will really give them a much more rounded view of uh, what art and making objects is about. I, I saw some reactions in the, um, at the opening the other day and down at the library during the week. Uh, folks who were not there, they, they, there were two categories. When they were around, the children, uh, the blind children, when they were present, they watched the people, they watched our blind people more than they watched the uh, pieces themselves, more than they really seemed to be looking at the art. But when no blind persons were present in the gallery, it was kind of a strangety to them to be able to walk in there and pick something up. They weren't used to that. And they, it was almost like they were afraid to. When they finally did, they picked, oh, you know, I got reactions like, you can look at this thing for a week and you never appreciate its full tactile quality until you pick it up. Art has many different facets. Some people use objects, others use their bodies. Speaking with hands is a body language many deaf people must use in order to communicate. Troy Bussard from the Louisiana School for the Deaf has taken sign language one step further to include his whole body.
Okay, let me see if I got this right. Thank you, Troy, and happy birthday. I hope I got it right. Thank you very much. You know, people like Troy who are handicapped from birth have never known what it's like not to be not handicapped. But most handicappers become disabled after living a so-called normal life. For adults who suddenly find themselves in a wheelchair, deaf, or blind, the change in their life also changes their outlook on life. Do you think you live a normal life now? I live, yes, as normal as normal can be. For more than 660,000 Louisiana disabled people, their message is clear, even though many can't stand up to be heard. The handicapped people are trying to help the non-handicapped people overcome their attitudinal problems. As soon as they see you, they automatically, you know, cut you out of about 90% of life, that you're not able to uh, compete with them. They automatically see a handicapped individual, and they just uh, pull a little dollar. Well, that's the attitude that, you know, we've been fighting uh, for years, and that attitude is finally, I think, changing. Handicappers make up about 15% of the population. Only you don't hear too much about them, because up until recently, they were pretty much ignored. The fact is, most people don't pay too much attention to the handicap. Much of the time, they are seen as those people in wheelchairs. At least that's the way it was for Patsy Barrett, Ken Vince, and Kathy Mohawk before they became part of the handicap statistics. And the whole thing of taking your body for granted. Yeah, we do until it happens to you. All these, these things that... and and. My association now with handicapped people, are di it's different because I'm in the same boat with them. In 1975, Kathy had a brain hemorrhage which was compounded with a stroke. The double trauma left her without feeling on her left side, half blind in both eyes, and a pain that remains with her constantly. Ken has been in the wheelchair since he was 16 when he broke his neck in a diving accident. Okay, Ron. It was something, you know, that uh, you never think is going to happen to you, especially when you uh, hear that you had a broken neck because uh, all you knew is people die from broken necks. Patsy caught a virus 25 years ago which attacked her nervous system, paralyzing her from the waist down. It's a very strange thing, and I wish I could tell you that I had been brave and courageous and uh, suffered in silence and all this kind of wonderful things, but that's not true. I yelled and screamed and cried, and I took it out on my children, I took it out on my husband, and that's the, the, a natural way uh, that people react when they have traumatic situations. I personally uh, am a resilient person, so I, I, I just tried to figure out where would I go next. Uh, I realized I couldn't work uh, as a laborer, uh, but I wondered if I'd ever be able to work, and how would I be able to do other things? How would I be able to take care of myself? I knew that I'd be dependent on people the rest of my life. I term that as an LSC, lifestyle change. Yes, that was very difficult, because in the very beginning, I did not know what was happening to me. And I basically could not see the forest for the trees. Well, I yelled and screamed and cried till I got it all out of my system. And then I realized it wasn't going away. So whatever the choice did I have, I either had to live with it or die and I didn't die, so I live with it. Learning to live with a handicap is a long and tedious struggle. For most disabled adults, it's a relearning process in which their body and mind must readjust to the physical Here limitations their body has become subjected to. Jennifer, could you cut this for Mother, please? Thank you. Mom, how long is this? It used to be a real, real big problem, and I, that is something that I love to do is cook. I love to cook, and I do need some assistance in cooking, especially when it comes to cutting up things. I just think that your person just has to um, make up their mind that they want to get as much out of life as they can. That's the thing, to get as much out of life as you, you know, as an individual want and can. Without this, I couldn't get around. You notice all the, the spasms that I have in my legs and my arms, this causes me not to be able to use a van. Uh, I would tend to flip over while every time we hit a bump. 
And so this has always been my mode of getting in and out. I do what I do to survive, just like you do. What I do is, you know, I have to work to make a living. And I knew that. If I was going to get anywhere in life, I had to have, you know, make a living. So I did what I had to do. I couldn't dig a ditch. But the idea was I knew I had to use my mind. So I tried to tune it up, but I didn't know what I would do. The way that I got interested, you know, in college and other things is I had a therapist who was taking foreign languages. Given a little time to readjust, the adult handicapper can usually overcome their physical limitations. What they can overcome are the physical and psychological limitations imposed on them by non-handicappers and their general lack of concern. From time to time, there is a backlash with the handicapped community. You know, you would think everybody would love baseball, apple pie, motherhood, and the handicapped. <laughs> but that's not true. Even Ann Landers had a, a letter the other day about the woman who was very resentful of the handicapped parking places. Handicapped individuals, sometimes I have, you know, problems motivating. On the other hand, there are some people who are condescending to handicapped individuals. The first thing they say is, uh, you know, oh, well, he can't do that. Or, oh, poor little thing. Or, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, I, I like handicapped people. I knew so-and-so's son. They had one. Uh, I'm asking the person to put them to work, though. That's the big key word, isn't it, employment? Because it seems like people who are employers would be a little apprehensive about a person like yourself. Really, I believe anyone would. Even I would sometimes. The thing is that I can't use my arms. I can't use my legs. I have to use a number of different types of apparatus to, you know, do whatever I do. For instance, you know, I have a typewriter here in front of me. I have to use a mouse stick. This mouse stick, you know, uh, I use to type at home or I could use a type anywhere if I had a typewriter available that I needed to use. I have a telephone with a with dialed-in numbers to save me from dial-in numbers. And of course, you know, good old Ma Bell has made the punch button type uh, telephones, and it makes it easy to press a bunch of buttons. And of course, that's the way I'm able to do things. So it's also being able to modify a job site for a handicapped individual. But jobs and job site modifications aren't the only obstacles keeping handicappers out of the mainstream of life just getting around can be a major hassle. My grandmother used to say challenges build character and people in wheelchairs, they must have more character <laughs> than anybody in the world because we really face some wonderful challenges. Um, however, the city is beginning to put in curb cuts, uh, see steps, curbs, those are the kinds of architectural barriers that a person in a wheelchair faces or who has a mobility impairment. Sharp inclines are a problem. A wheelchair trying to get up five steps doesn't make it. Doesn't make it. The transportation problem that we have, and here's where I am directly affected, because I am unable to drive, and there's no transportation available. Well, it's um, a breach of civil rights if I'm not able to get into a building that it has a government agency there, for example, if I need food stamps or if I need stamps out of a post office. My tax money pays for public mass transit, and yet there's not one bus in this city that I could get on in a wheelchair. It's sort of like the early colonists. Uh, back in the early 1700s, they were very resentful of taxation without representation to the Crown. And the disabled community, we, we are taxed to support public um, programs and um, facilities. And then when we're denied use of that, I find it a very serious breach. The economy as it uh, faces us today is calling for us to uh, develop our clout and uh, develop unity, develop, bring ourselves together to have numbers so that we can have a voice. All right, the next question is, I see it in your mind. Why do we want to go to all the trouble to support these special populations? I mean, after all, we're such a small number. But 15% of your population on welfare is a real drag. And as long as we're not willing to stay there and we want to work and we want to become productive citizens, where a curb cut 
or uh, a piece of special equipment and a transportation vehicle to allow us to go to work and be productive citizens, support our families, is a betterment to all the community. Anytime you upgrade one segment of your community, your whole community profits. Again, we've come to the end of another folks edition. If you are a non-handicapped person, we hope you've gained a new perspective toward your handicapped neighbor. And for you handicapped viewers, please be patient with us non-handicappers. We have a lot to learn about you, so help us. We leave you tonight with a Hammond State School combo and the Music Therapy Band. <laughs>